Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Let's see. Good morning. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Now I got this, I think. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you. It's very cool. interesting. I have two of Vicky. I don't know why I have two of Vicky. I don't have two of Vicky, so <laughs> <laughs> that's probably a good thing. <laughs> I, I don't know. There are all these times I wish that I was able to clone myself. <laughs> oh, that, that could be very dangerous. What on earth? Now I have two Stephanie's. Could my second one clean my house, please? Uh, <laughs> you'll just, just have, saying. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to talk to her about that. <laughs> Now I've got us good. All right. Is your power back on or is your furnace fixed? Yes. Thank you. Monday, it it uh it was indeed fixed. So oh my goodness. And yes, they they called and they said, so how how is everything? And I'm like, it's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we even um my kids came last night and my grandkids came to celebrate my birthday from a week ago and it was nice because they they run their house very warm and uh of course they were very freezing last week but yeah we were able to have it in a decent place they stayed a lot longer than they did last week <laughs> okay i've got 831 what what do we have questions about thoughts about this week well you had told us to remind you a couple weeks about, ago about a story about a little girl who came and found her little brother or something yes thank you i was thinking about that just yesterday in fact i was telling um a friend about it yesterday. Okay, so I always cry when I tell this story. Um, the story is, and I don't know if it's true, but I know it tr has truth, right? So um, <clears throat> this uh, couple, these parents have a second child and the, the baby's a girl. And, um, and the little boy's probably about three and they weren't sure how the little boy would get on with the sister. You know, sometimes a, a young older sibling though uh, can not treat the baby very well. So <clears throat> the parents are concerned about that. Uh, but this one, e and, and this one evening, they hear the little boy creeping across the hallway and they have a baby monitor. So they figure, you know, we're close enough. We can watch what happens if there's a problem, we can quickly intervene. And, and so they watch uh, the little boy come into the room and he goes to the baby in the crib and says, baby, will you please tell me about Jesus? I've almost forgotten him. And yeah why I love that story and it was when it was told to me years and years ago is and where that truth is that our mother or God puts us in our mother's womb right whether or not we ever knew our mother still God had a purpose for us and and he does have a purpose for us we've been created for a, a purpose and when when we're conceived god knows us intimately right and and there's no reason for me at least to suspect that we don't know god intimately at that place um i used to think that it was during birth that that separation began to to occur but when my daughter my youngest daughter was pregnant with our second um, her, our second grandbaby, her youngest, um, and even then with her older, uh, she, the baby, Aiden's father, the sperm donor, walked away when she was three months pregnant. 
And so there was all of that tragedy within her and all these pieces that she had to work with that was already affecting Aiden in utero. And, and so that you know, that uh, earthly human side of us, right? The, the body uh, embodied human um, is already feeling that separation, experiencing that separation from God. And so we come into this world with that separation, but it's at, in those early years that that's when we know God and Jesus best right? Because we still remember there. And um, so what happens in church is that we feel like we have to teach children about God. We have to teach children about Jesus when they know him better than we do. Um, And that's what I've told parents. Once I figured that out, I said, you know, I wish somebody had told me that as a young mom. And and so the best thing young parents and then parents of younger children, uh, the best thing we can do is figure out how to nurture that relationship and not cut it off, right? Not not think it out. And if you've had Dr. Bill for any classes, you you may hear him say that um, so often or so many of us are educated past our obedience. And I would say we're educated past our relationship with God. Does that make sense? So we have to learn these spiritual habits. We have to learn spiritual disciplines. We, We have to learn these ways of moving us aside so that our spirits can communicate once again with God and Jesus. That makes some sense. Yep. So that's why for me, faith formation is so important and not education. You never heard of it as faith education, have you? No. Nope. Not for me, at least. No. <laughs> Vicky, are you? Do you want to say something? Oh, she no, just... I'm good. I'm okay. just listening. You were leaning in towards the towards the camera. I wasn't sure if you were turning <laughs> on your voice or. I know that I I said that a long. Well, the first thing I always tell people is that when I. Uh, work with dads to be the number one thing I tell them is this I could tell you to the moon came home that what you were going to feel but until that baby comes out I can't explain it because for men it's a different whole different experience I said um, but the first time they open their eyes you'll see God Mm. I said, God will look back at you. And I said, so when you brought that story up, it sort of reminds me, I always tell them, I said that you'll see God in their eyes. He'll come through to you and he'll smile at you. And you'll realize, really, there is a God in this world. Um, I find it a privilege to be with people when they're right at, um, at the moment of dying and uh, it's because that door of death opens right yeah. and so we're no closer I, well I can't say no closer but it's probably the second closest no I think it's the closest in in our human experience that we get to see um, onto the other side right onto it so there's a closeness we get as as uh, you know, God or Jesus is ready. I mean, for me, it's Jesus is ready to you know take their hand and move them through. But the second closest then would be at birth, because of that. You know, their babies are the purest that we get to be in in our birth because they've come, or in our lives because they've come into this world already jaded in some ways 
Um, and I don't hold to my theology is um, I don't hold on to original sin. Um, I don't. Yeah, my theology doesn't include original sin. Um, so what I'm saying here is that that baby, again, while it's been jostled and has, has experienced all this earthly stuff that gets in the way of our spirits, still not like we're going to, we're going to experience in the coming months and years. I think you're right. I think, you know, life, life beats us up and jades us a little bit, and that's not to relieve of us of any responsibility because we are responsible to how we respond, but so much of that. Uh, by the way, my name says Tyler, but uh, you called me Troy. You can call me either. On do you know, I do that all the time. I do not know why I do it. When I mention you to Bill, you know, or something, I'll go, Troy, yeah. he just looks at me you like, know, because we have you, both of us have Tyler in class yeah. and I'll say, it's oh, fine. Yeah, Troy. yeah, sorry. So, so sorry. It, no, it's fine. It's funny because my name wasn't very popular when I was younger. I'm 49. Same. Yeah. I, I uh, do not want to hear it. I know. I'm sorry. I know I got to pick my audience. But anyway, my name wasn't popular when I was little. So all the little, you know, the bicycle real license plate that had your name, no one had them. And so mm -hmm. about 15, 20 years ago, it became popular. I went to Walmart. I bought that stuff up. So so my house is decorated. So little fun fact about me. And tell your husband, I his his uh, Zoom thing is the same time as yours. I, you, <laughs> I jumped on here first. So tell him it's nothing personal. I tell him, I said, I get Troy. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. So give Troy an F, but give Tyler yeah. an A. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, and Tyler, I don't want to hear about the whole uh, popular name. I okay. Grew up, I grew up with Bewitched. Okay. Oh, right. You're that, so, Aaron. So every Andorra name, nickname I got. Uh -huh. Here, oh, Durwood, oh, Darwood, yeah. Darby. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, yep, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm a middle child. <laughs> okay, you win. <laughs> okay, <laughs> hey, so that explains why she forgets your name, Tyler. You're the middle child. Well, that explains why it hurts so bad. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll digress. I'm just teasing. <laughs> Okay, what but, else? Well, I it was I found this week's probably the most intimate week of all the weeks. Mm. I I really did um, because hearing uh, reading oh, I shouldn't say here reading everybody's faith journey I thought was wonderful. I I loved hearing where people felt like they were on the scale of things. Um, um, and I guess for me, I consider myself a disciple, but then I read everybody else's stuff and I'm kind of like, okay, am I, I know I'm not fulfilling everything in that list, uh, but, am, but I still consider myself in that, that box and then I'm still working on it, but, and there's still parts of it I have to get, but I still feel like I'm in that that category. But am I reading that wrong? Uh, yeah. So, uh, but it's a mind shift, okay? So, so this is where I want us to go. Um, we tend to check off the boxes, right? So I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. We think of it as, Darren, you said the word categories right yeah. so if i got some of this i'm here i've got more of this and i do here it, here's where it's it it really is and where it becomes that personal these are these are the habits these are the experiences that we have that uh, allow us to grow okay so um if you go back to clinton and clinton talks about the different experiences that that we have, like where one is where our faith is tested. Um, so a, a faith test, uh, those help us to grow. You can't manufacture those. That that that's what happens. So these 
when the those Christian disciple phases of our lives, if you will, uh, we're not manufacturing, checking off those boxes. There are these supportive practices. So um, an LTG, and again, I've, I've got to reconsider um, introducing this rather this week rather than next week. Um, but an LTG, a, a life transformation group, is uh, starts with two people in, uh, if you will, kind of in a covenant relationship. And they say every week, we're going to read a significant amount of scripture. We each are going to have people that are not yet Christians that we're going to pray for. Here are my, say, three. Here are my three. And I'll pray, we'll pray for one another. Then you have the uh, accountability questions that you're asking one another each week. And I was going to print this out. I don't have it in front of me at the moment. Um, so accountability uh, question, where were you dishonoring? Did you dishonor somebody in your relationships? Um, did you give in to an addiction? Everybody then has their own question, that one piece that they will struggle with. Um, one of the beautiful pieces of this is that you all you have to do is answer yes or no to every question except about giving into your addiction, I believe it is, and then you explain, you know, how did you... How did, how did that happen? Um, uh, and, and the last question, it's the best. Have you lied to us on any of these answers? <laughs> you can say yes and not even say what it is. Uh, it, it, so it is, but it is this continual accountability. And in doing that, that allows us to do that personal growth. Now, here's the rest of a life transformation group. And I call them journey groups. You start with two. And you add a third. Uh, so you're praying for, for other, each other, right? And so together, you're, and you're always asking, Lord, who is it that you, know, you want into, you know, us to invite? So you, you bring a third. But the, the language is when you get a, a third, your group is pregnant. And you're looking for a fourth. And you're pregnant because these two groups become, or this one group becomes two groups, right? Does that make sense? So say uh, Stephanie and I are the first two in our group. And then, I don't know if I can do it. So uh, Stephanie, uh, we're, we're praying, you know, we've got our, our say, six people we're praying for. And then, uh, and we decide we're going to bring in this person. They're on Stephanie's list, but we're going to bring in this person. And they're learning, you know, what we're doing, we're bringing them in, and then we're still praying for that fourth person. And it might be another one of Stephanie's, it might be one of mine. Uh, and, and then as we come together, and this fourth person is learning what we're doing, and it's so dad blasted easy, okay, it's in the little brochure for you, you just go through the instructions are there, everything. And then when you're here, then Stephanie will break off with one person, I'll break off with another, and we repeat it all again. Okay, it's Tyler. So and I, I, I was in a group, we started this 20 years ago doing this, and we started off with a group of four just to break the ice, and it took us about a year to get really to the point where you can honor, answer those honestly. And then we split, and we recently split again. We were looking at it, we met, it's been almost 20 years now, and two of the original guys and I still meet and we're looking for our third again. We went to a breakfast in a different restaurant because I had a doctor's appointment. At another table by us was the other group that started the same time we did 20 years ago, two of the original members. And we're still really bad about lying and being legalistic with our answers. I'll just tell you that's something you never quite get over. So, But those questions, it's, it's a website called Character That Counts. And there's accountability questions. And there's men's women's and there's 10 each and they're, they're worded differently and then there's like 40 questions for couples there's ones for teams but it's character that counts and it's um uh, accountability questions is the topic and it's exactly like we're talking about what have you allowed to rob you of your joy where have you shared the gospel um 
with guys, it's it's about lust. With the for the women, it's another one where something doesn't honor God. Uh, gossip. They're so really good. And then the last question is always: Have you lied to us on your answer today, or have you told a half truth, or something like that? So um, it's fantastic. So I just want to affirm what you're saying. It's a great, great tool for accountability. Awesome. I have to go up there and look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mentioned this in one of the the uh, posts yesterday that our friend Neil Cole uh, is the one who at least put this the way the way we've learned it. And uh, he wrote a book, who knows how many years ago, 20 years ago or so that explained it. But the way he was using it or developed it was to plant churches. And so you could, you can plant churches with two people and you're praying for, you know, your two more and then you're praying. So again, it's that exponential growth. And he, um, he founded churches and particularly house churches. He concentrated on, uh, on house church, the house church movement. It works. And I'll tell you, one of the frustrating parts of it, really frustrating is, um, is that people won't won't do it they won't use it they like getting with their groups they you know and, and i believe a part of that is we don't get to have that kind of intimate group uh, in, in uh, a, a faith group if you will so we love being in that and we don't want to we don't want to divide or to separate um and that's part and parcel that's that's the way it is and um this church uh, that I was recently um, consulting with, they had no spiritual base at all. It's um, an ELCA, a Lutheran Church of America, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And, um, and so I never had to make a recommendation that said, you've got to get your spiritual base into place. You know, the way y'all treat each other the way you do and you're not doing and what you want to do. You've got to get a base. Just pray. That would be nice if you could just pray. And, and here are some tools for doing that. And so I gave them the journey groups. They were going to do it. I came back. Let's see. They were supposed to have started by January. I was back in May at Mother's Day and there was one group going They'd brought in a third. There had been no multiplication. These two men tried to tell me that, well, you know, they just couldn't get together every week because, you know, they traveled and this one had this. And I said, oh, you don't have phones. And, and they admitted that they do have phones. It, it was just that commitment wasn't there. And then, oh my goodness, there was this young man, a junior, and, uh, and this is their council or their, you know, I would call it their executive uh, committee and um, this this boy, a junior in high school, he nobody had invited him. In fact, uh, in the group, this executive group, people hadn't invited one another to be be part of their group. And this kid wanted to be in a in a group. So I told the two men, I was like, well, why haven't you invited Travis? You know, you need to. Yeah, you could. I won't tell you you need to, but you could. And uh, they were, yeah, but, 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 okay, that's fine. And Travis went and started his own group, one with um, a, a kid who'd never been to church and another one who was going to church, who's now on the council with, with Travis, right? Uh, so I know that Lucy kept writing this, people are hungry. And um, this is great to use with your young people, uh, younger people, um, I spoke at a youth conference a few years ago, and <laughs> oh my gosh, we were talking about testimony, we got around to testimony, and the final evening, we had so many kids wanting to go up on the stage to give testimony about, you know, where they were getting to see Jesus, we finally had to cut it off after an hour, and then we had set up prayer, uh, prayer stations, and we had three where they could come for prayer and and then I was doing anointing and we had explained and two hours in we still had lines of kids and they wanted to be anointed so these other youth leaders I'm handing them I'm going put your hand out and I'm pouring oil into their hands you know it's like you go over there this is what you do 
you at listen to what they want prayer for you ask god all you have to do is thank you jesus will you will you please move in ways that that we need uh that we need whatever P poke your finger or your thumb in the oil in the name of the father son and holy spirit boom you're done um and we were still another 45 minutes and the people who were planning it were really upset with me. I didn't know what was gonna happen I, um, because we had a schedule that we had to keep. And these kids said, oh my gosh, why can't we do this in church? Why can't we? We can't. They know more than we do. They remember better than we do and yet we get in the way. Let me teach you how to pray. Let me tell you what you have to remember. I'm on the soapbox. So yeah, I wanna go back to those phases rather than categories, I suppose. Are, um, these, are, these are those habits, these, these um, they're more than tools. They these uh, tools that we have to use. A, a life transformation group catches us on a personal basis and accountability basis, a prayer evangelism basis. And if you're not doing that, I mean, disciples make disciples, right? So if you're not discipling here and being discipled and being held in accountability, you're not going to do it over here. So you've got to work work over here within that. Disciples, again, are making disciples. So if we're not um, getting straight about who we are and, and naming our own theology, um, I may have said this again, in, in seminary, uh, one of my first classes, I, I went part-time my first year and, and the first semester I took, <laughs> I don't know, it was Wesleyan theology, I think, and uh, in evangelism, intro to evangelism. It was the only evangelism class taught there for the four years I was was there with seminary, and uh, and Dr. Morris evangelism said, okay, your first assignment is due in a week or so, and you have to write out your your theology, and here are you know, middlers. So we had um, juniors, middlers, and seniors, and middlers second year going, oh wait, I haven't had theology yet. Wait, I can't write that. Blah blah blah. And Dr. Morris said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So he said, you have thoughts on God, don't you? And yeah. And he said, well, that's theology, theos, God, all of these thoughts, um, uh, you know, consideration. So what you're writing out is what you think about God, how you experience God, how you interact with God, because how are you going to tell anybody else if you can't articulate what you think or believe or know? So we think we have to go through theology oh. and they make us go through theology two years of theology where no. you know you learn about you know I don't know um Bart and uh Bultmann and Kierkegaard and all these these other people and then you regurgitate it and again I remember being a junior and hearing hearing Midler's going I'm I'm a Bartian I'm Bultmannian my head would just spin you know what am I going to be well you know I can theology really says that here are these different thoughts these different ways now what how do they inform you what how do you come out of how do you come out of that again the church we do injustice to that and particularly those of us that are on ordination or commissioning track maybe and then how do we teach our people and our young people theology? One of the coolest um, uh, approaches to teaching adults theology that I've heard is that you take different theological topics and you do this with a small group of people that you know will be committed to the process that will bring something into the process uh, and you're looking at as much of a diversity theological diversity as you can get you know some of our congregations are not di 
diverse, theologically or anything diverse. And uh, so you bring together, say, uh, six to eight people. You always want to start a group with an, with um, six to eight people. Nevertheless, an eight is your best uh, number because people will drop out. And if you've only got, let's say, six, now you're down to four. And that's not, uh, that doesn't give you very good critical mass. So when you're thinking about starting small groups, shoot for eight. Uh, so you bring these eight people, they make a commitment to get together once a month and you'll take these different topics. So one month would be baptism. One month is um, uh, communion, uh, you know, come up with whatever your, uh, your pieces are. And then everybody, has a different book and different readings based on um, uh, on a different perspective. And the I was so lucky to go to Baki Graduate University for my doctorate because there wasn't just one professor. Every course had multitudes of people. So when I started in the church planting, church multiplication, um, program and we had people from all over the country and even from other continents and uh, missionaries that have been working uh, with other uh, in other continents that would come and they would give their experiences and their teachings and different ways of doing things so that we could assimilate adapt them to what to what we did I love your dog Ashley um, <laughs> um, here she can be here that's okay uh, so, um, anyways, that's to say the one, the one guy who was doing this, he said, you know, he would give more evangelical readings to the more liberal of the folks in the group. And he would give really more liberal points of view and perspectives to the more evangelical folk, because he wanted you to read outside of your belief system. And so then you would read uh, whatever it was. And he said they were reading books. So you, you were reading this and then you would write a report, a book report. Uh, and, and then you would make sure you'd have enough copies. You'd send it out to everybody. So they would read those and you'd come together for that meeting, like a half day meeting. And you'd sort through all of that. What did you hear? What did you see? Um, what did that mean to you? And so you're building your building theology and remembering that you know, God is even more brilliant than a diamond is, right? And how many different facets a diamond has. And, uh, and my facet may be diametrically opposed to Jeff's and Jeff's to Albert's and Albert's to Ashley's to Daniel's to Tyler to Vicky's to Darren's, right? So we all have these different perspectives. And that's why to me, respect is, well, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons it's respect is so important. I, I may not agree with you at all, but one, I have to respect what you bring to the table. And I have learned for me that I have to be open to even the diametrically, uh, uh, that that's in diametric opposition to what I think, because if, if that person is a person of God, of Jesus, and, uh, and they're doing their own spiritual work, then they've got as much of God as I do. And I've got something to learn from that. So when we talked about being missionaries this week, some of you did see, you know, you were catching our thinking of missionaries really is about, right, going off and doing missions. But a lot of that, our, our Christians, um, our disciple, little d disciples that are going, um, that are going to help others. Um, for me, I used to feel guilty that I didn't go overseas to, you know, to help people overseas. And I realized I'm a domestic 
missionary, that my, that my um, work is different. And if you go back to the fivefold ministries that Paul talks about, uh, he says, you know, some are called to be prophets and uh, evangelists, right? And apostles are one of those, and apostles are those that, that go out, that speak out. Uh, generally, church planters are apostles, um, uh, are missionaries of, of sorts. And we don't have to go overseas to do that or even out of our, our community necessarily. And that's the other part. Not all of us on, on that continuum or within those phases. And, and maybe it's not to talk about that in those uh, phases in terms of a continuum, because some of us will never be called to be apostles. Some of us will never be called to be missionaries. All of us are called... And that. Um, all of us are called to be disciples. Jesus didn't call Christians, right? He, he called disciples. He made disciples. Thank you for clarifying that because I, when I looked through the assignment at first, I'm like, oh, I really don't feel called. And maybe is that then I started asking myself the hard questions. And then I started doubting. I'm like, if I don't feel called to be that, am I shunting my faith, you know, or is this some progress that that, you know, if I don't do that, then I haven't reached the top level, which I know isn't Chris how Christianity works. I mean, and so I tongue in cheek, you, you know, use the term check the box, but, um, but I did struggle with that. So I'm glad you're clarifying that because I feel like, oh, I'm going to be a 94% Christian because I don't feel called to go anywhere, but my community. So thank you. You're welcome. And thank you. This, this feedback, I have to obviously have to redo the videos and um, all the videos. And so I'll be working on that um, in the fall, probably after the conflict course uh, that, yeah. And so those pieces are gonna definitely come up and be in there. Yeah, um, I am. Um, yeah, I, that was it's kind of funny that you kind of touched on that part because if you notice in my answer, one of the first things I said was that I don't believe in absolute. Well, first of all, let me just clarify. I'm not an absolute statement person. Uh, the only absolute I believe in is God. Other than that, everything is subject to your historical, your upbringing, and everything plays a role. So I'm not an absolute thinker. So if you notice in my answer, the first thing I said is there's no hard, fast lines in these. These are more faith. Like I like the when you switch to the, use the word phases. It's the existence of how you exist at different points in time. And I think we float between all of them. And I've never been one to think of missionary as someone who has to go abroad because the, the, simply a missionary is, 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 is your helping side of things. Uh, my wife, for example, is one of the great missionaries that I know because she deals with the homeless in Oklahoma on a daily day basis. And she's broadened my scope of that. So that's mission work. So the way I think I was struggling with it until you took the parameters off that you just did. And it now is okay. I'm like, okay, I never thought about what well, I need to achieve this. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. This can't be hard, fast lines because that would mean we're all alike. There's no way to do that. These, these are like we use at work. These are dotted lines, not solid lines. Yes, 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 exactly. Exactly. Um, I've wondered um, from time to time during the course of this last week, uh, if we were to uh, have a sit down with Peter and Paul and present them with that, those charts, uh, where they would say they fell in those phases or stages, especially at different times in their lives, like when, uh, you know, Peter denied Jesus or when Peter and Paul started fighting with each other, um, whether, you know, where they thought they would, they would fall. And this aspect of uh, the criteria um, got me thinking a lot too, because of part of the discussion that we're having right now, uh, what's a missionary uh, and where do they go? And one of the things that I realized soon after coming here, this is my third year here in this community, is there's a vast uh, mission field that exists here in folks that self-identify as Christians that have no relationship with Christ. Um, it's rampant cultural Christianity. And I've got a small group that's meeting right now, studying a book by uh, Dean and Sarah. It's called the, uh, the Unsaved Christian. 
Mm -hmm. uh, reaching cultural Christianity with the gospel. And it's been a very uh, challenging, convicting kind of small group study. And a lot of these folks are coming to grips with the uh, idea that we have a mission field that exists right here within our community. Definitely, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it, it is, this is that piece it's so important, you know, we, we go to church, you know, we do good things, nice things, but how are we changing lives, right? What's, that's the missionary part. And it's got to be grounded in that spiritual. That's why I keep coming back to this Christian place is that how, um, how are we reclaiming the spiritual? So often for so many of us, we, um, we're baptized and we're who we made it. And, uh, you know, to be baptized, you assent, basically. I believe that, you know, um, Jesus, son of the living God, I want him to be my Lord and Savior. I want him to be my CEO. I want to follow him. I want to live the way he does. But that's assent. That's still in our head. And maybe in our heart, there's maybe some desire there. But if we're not building onto that relationship, we're not going to grow. We're only going to grow within what people tell us. And, and this is one of my bugaboos with preachers. Yeah, we're preaching the same stuff that's been preached for 2000 years, right? So we think we can stand up there and say, hey, love your neighbor. You know, we say, love, love one another. We say, um, go out and make disciples. Are we doing it? No. We tend, <laughs> we tend to think that um, if I just preach it better, you know, let me preach it strong. Well, hello, let's talk Billy Graham, right? And let's, let's talk Martin Luther King. I mean, let's talk these preachers that are preachers beyond preachers. You don't get it. We're still doing it. We're still preaching it. It's not our, it's not about preaching. And it's not about guilting people. You know, a lot of people do things because we've guilted them into it uh, or because we want to check the box and go on to the, the next category. What's gonna change us are those pieces are, you know, again, it's those life transformation groups. It's meeting in small groups. It's, it's uh, with other people. And so it's, there's that theoretical, why is that happening? What's the importance in that? Why is that grounding for me? Uh, what, what do I have to, to uh, learn or experience from that? Why do I need a mentor? Because you know, I don't know everything about being uh, a children's minister, right? Or a, a director working with children, or I don't know everything about being a bivocational minister. I, you know, don't know everything about being a pastor. So, you know, one of the ways to find a mentor is to see someone who's doing what you want to do um and not you know it's not oh i i, I see that big um mega church pastor that's what i want to do let's just take it in steps right um jeepers um uh, willow creek christian church started in south barrington right chicago and and i remember you know they came out with all of this curriculum you know like wow all of us are using their curriculum heck I'm sorry, it does not translate to a 100 member church, you know, a 200 member church, a 10,000 member church. Yes. So we all, you know, we're buying it up. We're just doing it. We're investing it. It doesn't work for us. So, you know, you don't go ask, uh, I don't know, uh, Pete Van Ward, who's here in Columbia. You don't ask Pete to be your mentor. You go one side, uh, one size up and say, what, you know, we, we walk with me, will you meet with me, you know, every couple of weeks, I'll buy you tea or coffee, that's usually mine, can I buy you tea, coffee, or, uh, or soda, and I, because I can afford those, and, you know, can, can we, can we do that, or could I just come to you, and not inconvenience you, those are mentors, and then our spiritual directors are those that challenge us on, on the faith 
the faith place. They'll teach us, um, they'll teach us um, a, a variety of spiritual um, habits. They'll talk about how's that going? How's that working? What do you want to, um, what are you hearing from God? I don't know when I do spiritual direction. Most of my coaching is, you know, what did you read in scripture last week? Uh, or in, since we met one another, what really spoke to you? What, God, what is God saying to you? Where's your heart right now? Use one word, one word to, to tell me about, you know, how you're feeling within your spirit. Or um, what's the other one? Uh, oh, if you had to pick somebody from the Bible, I use this with ministers. I don't use this with, with lay people. But if you had to pick one story in the Bible right now that that um, you can identify with, that you might use to talk about or to say something about where you're at right now, what would that be? Who would that be? Okay. So um, you know, that's the kind of questions a spiritual director gets to, and they're the deeper ones. And then a coach is the one who pulls out. So the way it was explained to me, mentors speak into you, they're giving you of their, you know, of their expertise, of their knowledge, um, uh, of their experience may not necessarily be expertise, but you know their experience is what works, what doesn't. They can help. Um, they can help uh, talk about that in a way. This what we do here is mentoring in this group. We don't have much time, but right, that's like okay. Here's some observations, or you know, to listen, say okay. Um, a uh, a coach there is going to ask questions and pull out of pull out of you. Um, like Tyler, if you hadn't shared what you, you, sh you know, shared about your small groups, or if we mm -hmm. had time, I'd say um, uh, something like, so how did that work? How did that work last week? Or what, what, um, what would you, what would you switch up based on yeah. something that you had shared? Right. So that's more of that, that coaching. You mentioned Willow Creek, and I'm a, I'm a student of Willow Creek back in the 90s and early 2000s. I'd been to all their things in Gateway in Dallas and Church on the Move in Tulsa. Um, and, and, and I was a worship leader for a 1400 member church. So that was, it was right in our wheelhouse. But they worked so hard to create small groups. They, in, in Church on the Move, they call them sections, and that, that is your small group. And, um, you know, Willow wanted to have cell churches, which is the ones that meet during the week. We have the benefit of small church pastors is we've got that function. We don't, our church sings happy birthday and happy anniversary every week because there's enough people there that we know each other and celebrate that kind of stuff, which you can never do in a room with 1400 people in it. So we have that closeness and you give up a lot of the anonymity. You can't just sneak in and sneak out. I'm not gonna be able to say anonymity. the word. Right. <laughs> yeah. Anonymity, you can't sit in the back row and not be noticed, um, which is maybe a downside for some because you do lose a little bit of that. But but for those who love the close knit community feel of church, it's you're right. It, Willow isn't for everybody, but some. But either is a small church. Right. One of the okay. two pieces about Willow. One is we went to their midweek worship, which is where that was their believers worship uh, yeah. was midweek. Believers and yeah. um, <clears throat> the we only went to one of them. But I was so impressed because the people in front of us were in a small group and they all were sitting there, you know, talking and what, and then the uh, people, so they were, you know, kind of there. And then there was a group more directly behind us and they were uh, uh, obviously in a small group, but there was a study done and it, it may be as old as 10 years ago. Um, Willow did survey their people and what they found was they didn't have a depth of faith. And so they began to completely redo their small groups because they weren't doing the faith connections and they were, you know, they wanted to go deeper. Okay, I, we have to go. I'm sorry, I've talked a lot. It, we are past our place right now. Are we good? Good to go? All right, may I pray for us? Jesus, thank you for not putting us into categories. Thank you for the ways that you, um, you compel us, that you push us, that um, I'm here this, um, all the time, I know, Father, um, for the ways that you um, sometimes have to hit us over the head 
or trip us up. And uh, thank you for, uh, again, for the ways you compel us, that you pull us forward, that you um, inspire us and continue to move us past uh, thinking, move us past wisdom, move us past the thoughts of others so that we can, um, we can um, move more closely to the you we knew uh, even before we came out of our mother's wombs, um, continue to, uh, so I guess it's, um, Father, drive us backwards. Uh, yeah, um, just continue to build in us or to, I don't know, deconstruct in us um, everything that gets in the way of our, um, even our desire to uh, to live um, out of your will, to live into your will, to walk into your ways. Oh my goodness. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this time and continue to open our hearts uh, and our minds. And thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, <laughs> okay. That was the double. <laughs> do, 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 do. Okay. And Darren, I was thinking of um, do, do. Do, 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 do. That's one of my ringtones. I'm going to have to assign it to yours now. Okay. Yes. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the ways you keep teaching and stretching me. And thank you. All right. I will Great session, guys. see you later. Hey, and, and Dr. Chris. Yes. I have to say that I got my list of 16 disciplines that I have to do with my candidacy. <laughs> and they followed so much of the line of disciple down the line of that list. I was like, it was freaky. So I just wanted to say you, the reaffirmation of all that has been blessed. Thank you. Well, and Darren, I'll tell you, when those first came out in mid-America, Janice Legg and I were the ones who took all of this um, theological gobbledygook and put it into the practical and took what was being said and put them into objectives. And when we were still the center for ministry, <clears throat> excuse me, we, uh, I wasn't on the, on the uh, curriculum committee, but those who were took all of those objectives and said, this is what we're going to teach. This is all each of our classes. This is what we're going to do. And not everybody knows that all the instructors know that. Uh, and so they haven't necessarily done that, but you'll find that um, all of the courses I teach follow directly within the objectives of, um, of the 16 what used yep. to be called 16 competencies, but God yes. forbid that you would tell an ordained minister that he or she should be competent. So now they're, <laughs> this, I'm serious. Now they're the, uh, what are I, they yep. called? Skills and practices. We don't have to be competent, but we have to be able to know what they are. That's right. Okay. Thank you. I say love you guys, but I won't. Bye. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Bye.